So Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal those who were ill. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But I beheaded John, who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. <coughs> Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Let's pray, shall we, as we come to these wonderful words and actions of the Lord Jesus. Our great God and Father, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would feed us Christ as we come to your words. And as we come to the table, this we ask in his name. Amen. Well, people who start companies, if they are growing or they want to grow, generally need to recruit. Some of you help companies, of course, in that process. In 1994, Jeff Bezos started a bookstore, an online bookstore, in a rented garage in Bellevue, Washington. In the early days, he knew that it would help if the company's name began with A, because it would get you to the top of lists. He called it Amazon, and at the moment, it has about a million and a half people working for it, including the lady who knocks on various doors on our streets on most days of the week. It's a massive venture with a huge number of workers. Well, God is undertaking a massive venture of rescuing from death and condemnation a people for himself who will go on to enjoy him forever in a new creation. Now, there are huge differences between Jeff Bezos and God's. And one of those differences is that Jeff Bezos could not do it by himself. He had to recruit. God could have done everything by himself. He chooses to recruit. That's the way he works. He loves to share. 
We actually saw that right back in the beginning of the Bible. God created the heaven and the earth. He created men and women. He started with one man. He gave Adam and Eve work to do, to be fruitful, to subdue the earth. He could have done that. But he gives humanity that task. But humanity, of course, has rebelled and been cursed, has made a complete mess, is under judgment. But God was not finished. He would rescue and he would succeed and he would establish his kingdom. And that rescue and that kingdom would be brought about by one man, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who we've been introduced to at the beginning of Luke. Jesus is the great saving king. Now, of course, this king could have done the great rescue operation all by himself, if I can put it like that. In one sense, he does. It is only he who can die for sin. It is only he who can conquer death. But in terms of a great people being gathered to himself, which he could have, in one sense, done all by himself, he chooses to work through others. He recruits and entrusts to people the work. We've already seen the beginning of that recruitment process. He has called the first disciples Luke 5, 10, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. You will fish for others. In chapter 6, he has chosen a special 12 as he builds a new people. And now at the beginning of chapter 9, the special 12 are sent on their first mission. They are not the last to be sent out in Luke's writings. In Luke chapter 10, we'll have the sending of the 70. It's not just the 12 who were sent, it's the 70. And then as we go into the book of Acts, there will be another great sending of the apostles. And then, of course, of all the church. So we see that the apostles, the 12, have been recruited And we're looking at this sending on this particular short mission. And we see in these verses in 1 to 9 that they are given power and authority. The power and the authority of the 12. We see that beginning the chapter. There's a beautiful pattern here. Jesus brings them. He calls the 12 together. He gives them power and authority And then he sends them to extend his ministry. He calls them together. He equips them with the power and authority. And he sends them. By the way, I think that is a beautiful pattern to see in Scripture. Gathering, equipping, sending. It's actually a pattern that is to do with our Sunday gathering. We gather We are equipped and strengthened. We are sent. Well, Jesus, as we see, is extending his ministry through these 12. This particular ministry of within the people of God, within Israel. They are to do it in his way. He gives them some principles They are to travel light. The packing list is very, very short for this journey. No extras. They will be dependent upon God. When they get there, they are not to move around. They are not to spend their time fretting and thinking about their accommodation. Not to think about the better offers when they come in, the biggest place, the better food. Stay in one place, stay focused on the job. And if they get rejected, they are to shake the dust off their feet and leave the unrepentant community. But that shaking was to be a testimony against them. It was to say, you have rejected. That is dangerous. And they go out. And they are successful. But there is, in these verses, a shadow over their mission. 
as we've seen Luke's gospel unfold, and as we will see it, that shadow is there right from the beginning. Herod hears about it. Herod is perplexed. He asks the question there, you know, what's going on here? What's going on? Well, there's various explanations. Maybe John has been raised from the dead. Maybe this is Elijah. Maybe this is one of the other prophets. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Herod wants to see him. I take it that is not good news. The next time that Herod will appear, it will be deep into Luke towards Jesus' execution. You see, the mission happens in the shadow of danger and death. The mission is causing, is kind of drawing attention of those who are very, very hostile to the cause. What do we learn from the sending of the 12, the sending of the special 12? He doesn't send everyone out here. He has a big group with him. We know the group already is much bigger than the 12. What do we learn about the sending of this special 12? And how does this help Theophilus? And Luke's gospel was written for Theophilus that he might be certain about the things about which he's heard. How does this help him to read about the sending of the 12? Well, I think here what we are seeing is that these special recruits this special 12 were given authority and they were given power. Just as they would be given authority and power to be apostles, to preach, to teach, to be witnesses to Jesus. You see, we rush and put ourselves in the place of 12. No, let's look at the 12. And these 12 who are being specially set aside, specially empowered, will do their work in Jesus' way. Now, this just may sound obvious. I think what is Luke is showing, and he's showing Theophilus, is that Jesus was preparing and planning for how the good news would spread. That all of this mission... Now, here in Luke 9, later with the 70, with the apostles after, um, with, with Pentecost and beyond, was all Jesus' great plan. He was training them up. He was setting them aside for this mission. And these 12 would have a special place in it. See, I think it would have helped Theophilus enormously to know that the 12 were special and had been set apart. Because Theophilus was going to hear the gospel from the 12, as we do. The apostolic writings are what, what basis of what we believe the gospel on. And we see that these 12 were set aside from the start and empowered even to help Jesus in this early stage of his ministry. And that's important for us. We must give thanks for the 12 and the way that God use them to give us the words that this wasn't the something the 12 dreamt up after Jesus had gone this is something that had been planned and prepared these are the foundational apostles with authority and they are being trained to work in a particular way, not to be greedy, to be dependent on God not to worry about where they were staying to warn people who wouldn't listen so I hope I've shown you it's all about the 12. That it was a training exercise for them that we might know who the 12 are and have confidence in their teaching. But does it have any bearing on us about the way that we work for the kingdom? Are there any principles here? We need to be careful, of course, to take these. We need to look for principles. I doubt whether if you go out to some friend's house and you talk about the gospel and they don't believe you, I'm not sure it would help the gospel if you started to shake the dust off your feet as you left. Or uh, gospel workers that we send out, they would not thank us if we just gave them this as a packing list and a support package as they went. We've got to be careful, but there are principles. 
speaks to us of dependence, a right dependence on God's. It speaks to us, I think, about contentment. One of the things that is most destructive in the Christian life is a restless pursuit of better stuff. It speaks to us that, yes, about lovingly warning others. So the 12 are sent on their mission. And they must have been very pleased. They must have been excited to have that power to heal. And they come back and they report it. And then, of course, we move into this next section of Luke, and they're quite deliberately by each other. Because next up is the feeding of the 5,000. And here, there is something of a come down for the disciples. Because here we see the failure of the 12 and the power of Christ. You see, if the sending out of the 12 shows that they were given power and authority, next up we will see that the special 12 have limitations. You see, when they get back from their successful mission, Jesus withdraws with his disciples. It may be that he was withdrawing from Herod. Jesus' Galilean ministry is coming to an end, and it might be just he's pulling away, and just is the time to move south. It may be he's withdrawing with his disciples because they need to be de- have a debrief and just a refresh after their ministry. But if they all thought they were going to get some peace, they were to be disappointed. The news spreads and a huge number of people make their way to find him. What does Jesus do? And this is very, this is unique to Luke. What does Jesus do when they come to him? What do you do? What do you do after a long day? How do you, what do you do after you've been working for days and days and days and you are exhausted? What do you do when you're just with those close friends who you'd like to hang out with for a little bit or maybe with your family? What do you do when the doorbell rings and it's someone who wants to come and talk? What do you do when the phone goes off again? What did Jesus do? Verse 11. He welcomes them. He welcomed them. Despite the busyness, despite his plans, he allowed the interruption and he welcomed them. He taught them and he healed them. And they listened, I presume. But now it's getting late. The disciples are watching this situation unfold. We don't know whether they would have welcomed them. We're not so sure. And they have a plan. And I can relate to this. They know who will listen to the notice. And so, that Jesus, we've got a notice for you to give to the crowd. And I can, if I can embellish the whole thing, uh, you know, I can imagine a little notice that, you know, the preaching is now finished. It's getting late. You need to go and find food. We've all had a good day. Maybe see you some other time. Jesus, can you just read this out to the crowd and we'll get them out? Uh, you know, it's late. Jesus won't give the notice. You give them something to eat. You can see the need, meet the need. We can't. We've got a little bit of bread and we've got a little bit of fish. It's not enough. I guess we could possibly go and buy some stuff, but they can't really see a way forward. We see here that they can't do it. So what does he do? Well, he gets the disciples to organize the crowds into group of 50. This is significant. Exodus 18, Numbers 31. 
Moses does that sort of thing. This is Exodus picture, the great rescue of God providing for the people. Everyone sits down and he takes the five loaves and the two fish. He looks up to heaven, he gives thanks, he breaks them and he gives them to the disciples to give out. In some way, this is absolutely amazing. The food does not stop coming. The disciples go and they come back and there's more and they go and he comes back and there's more. And the people are completely satisfied. 5,000 men, there'll have been women and children as well. A huge crowd is fed. And by the end, there are 12 baskets. Abundant provision for these people. How has this happened? Well, people try over, well, have tried over the years to deny the obvious. They really have tried to deny the obvious. And it's, in, you know, all sorts of creative theories. You may know of the pack lunch sharing theory. They all sat down. In fact, everyone did have food with them. It's a bit like a bring and share uh, tea at church. You come here at four o'clock and the tables are empty, 4.40 and the tables are heaving with food. It's often it's come out of nowhere, but actually it's been people bringing it in. Was it just that people brought it out? No, there's no hint of that. <coughs> Theory two, I kind of like this one. I mean, it's not right, but I kind of like it. Is the women sorted it out? <laughs> Remember back in Luke chapter 8, there was all those women who were now on the, t you know, following around and some of them were really wealthy and they were providing for Jesus. So you can imagine the scene, you know, these blokes, these 12, but we can't sort this out. And behind the scenes, there were these women who, you know, got it all together as only they can. And um, there it was all sorted. Well, again, there's just no evidence whatsoever for that. Theory three. Jesus hypnotized the crowd into believing that they were filled. <laughs> you see, people are desperate rather than believe the obvious. That Jesus, with his loving power, turned a small offering into a feast. This is the power of the redeeming God in action. And you see, all eyes must here be on Jesus. He is the center of attention. We have seen the question now running in Luke's gospel as it runs in the other gospels. Who is this? The disciples have asked this in the storm. Who is this who commands the winds and the waves? Herod has asked, Who is this? And in the very next section, Jesus will ask, his disciples, who do people say that I am? Here in this miracle, we are seeing confirmation of what we already know if we have been reading Luke with any sort of close attention. We have seen him raise the dead. We have heard him forgive sins. We have seen him conquer demons. We have seen him calm a storm. He is Lord over nature. And now with a prayer, he turns five loaves and two fish into a feast that feeds thousands and thousands of people and does so abundantly. Here is a Jesus who welcomes people, feeds them, teaches them, heals them, brings them to the kingdom and gives them the kingdom. <clears throat> he is the Savior, the saving God, the promised Messiah, bringing about a new exodus, a new rescue, and feeding his people abundantly in that process. If we were any good, if I was any, if we don't use we, if I was any good at planning, I would have put this passage on a day of the Lord's Supper. It is a complete accident that, uh, in my planning, but I am very grateful in the Lord's providence, uh, providential over that we have the Lord's Supper today. These words in um, 19... Um, sorry, sorry, not in 19, uh, in 16 and 17. Let me read them to you again. 
taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them and he gave them to disciples to distribute to the people. Later on, we will hear very, very similar language in Luke 22. Let me read that to you. 22, 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Jesus feeds his people that they might live. He fed them here. He feeds them at the Lord's table. He gives thanks. He breaks it. He gives it to them. And as we come to the Lord's table this morning, Jesus feeds you. He is the host. He welcomes you. It is his pleasure to feed you, to feed you salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and new life, which he provides for you in Christ abundantly. What about lessons here for the disciples? They were given power and authority, and they were successful on their first journey But their failure, I think, with the bread was a reality check. I don't think it's there to humiliate them. It just shows what they can do and what they can't do. See, as the mission goes forward, yes, they are given authority, but they do not have the power to save anyone. Only Christ can do that. Christ will use them. They will get the people to sit down. They will distribute the bread. They even provided a little bit in the first place. But it's Christ who feeds. Christ who saves. It's almost these two together. Yes, the power and the authority that disciples have, the special 12 have. But in the end, everything comes from Christ. It is Christ that we give out. Christ who equips and empowers. And Christ who saves. Their ministry will be, in one sense, giving what Christ gives to them, and they will give Christ to the people, the Savior to the people. And as we head towards the Lord's table, I just want to say, I think there are here vital lessons for us as we serve God. We who are workers for God. We are each recruited into our own role. The twelve had a special role, but we are as well recruited And we are to give people Christ in our teaching. And we are to serve people with what Christ has given us. I'd like to land with these verses, which are favorite verses of mine. From 1 Peter 4. I read them every Tuesday morning as I start work. I'm going to pick it up at verse 9. You may want to turn, you may just want to listen. 1 Peter 4, 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Of course, we offer hospitality because the Lord Jesus Christ was himself hospitable. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In other words, you are to use what you have been given. Yep, very clear so far. Listen to this. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. They are not your words. They are the words that have been given by God for the good of the people. If anyone serves, says Peter, they should do so with the strength that God provides. Those two things. If you speak, you are giving the very words of God. If you serve, you are serving with the strength that God provides so that, so that in all things, in all service, in all that we do for Christ and in Christ's power, so that in all things, God may be praised 
through Jesus Christ. So not ever to the disciples goes to the glory, but to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the great rescuer, the great Messiah, the great Savior, the one who in compassion welcomed the people and fed them through the disciples. We thank you for him and we thank you for the welcome that we have as we come to the Lord's table. And we ask that you would strengthen and renew us as we do so. And we thank you for this setting aside of the 12 and the empowering. We thank you for all that 12 still mean to us with the apostolic witness and testimony that you use them in this great project of salvation. And we thank you as well that you've called us to be servants. Help us to learn lessons from the 12 about contentment, about trust, and that whilst we have been given power and authority to serve you, we do so in your power to give others Christ, to serve in the strength that Christ gives us, with the very gifts that Christ gives us, that all to that might be to your glory. Write these things onto our hearts, we pray. Amen. Well, before we go to the Lord's table, let's stand and sing, Guide me, O thy great Redeemer. <laughs>